Our next speaker is the wonderful Sam De Brito. He is talking about building a better bloke, which is fantastic and I shall be all ears. He's a journalist, a writer and a popular blogger of All Men Are Liars with the Sydney Morning Herald and Melbourne Age. He's the best-selling author of Building a Better Bloke, Become a Man Women Want and No Sex with Your Ex. So we've got lots to learn here. Would you please welcome Sam De Brito. I can tell you one way to not be happy is to have to give a speech to 500 people at 4.30 on a Friday. I should be about three schooners in by now and I've been absolutely pooping myself for the last three days. It's terrifying. I thought this was just gonna be like 50 hippies in a room in the back somewhere. <laughs> have a look at you. Um, Something that um, Peter Fitzsimon said in his speech resonated with me. He said, the worst thing you can say as an Australian is, do you know who I am? Um, I actually wrote a column a couple of years ago um, where I accused a well-known Australian journalist of saying that. Uh, he's saying, do you know who I am? And, um, excuse my language, the dead shit sued me. Got $10,000 out of us. So. I would agree with Peter Fitzsimons. That is uh, probably the worst thing you can say, especially one journalist suing another is quite unheard of. Um, it's kind of ironic that I'm speaking about happiness because this has been probably, the last 18 months has been the worst year of my life. Um, my partner left me. Uh, she took our seven month old daughter with her. Um, I'm in family court at the moment. My, uh, my stepfather died last year. Uh, my mother's bipolar and she's struggling horrendously. And it's been very, very trying um, for our entire family, but it has made me focus on what causes happiness, um, for me at least. Today I'd like to speak broadly about um, a couple of things I wrote about in the book called Building a Better Bloke. Um, obviously, there's lots of women here, so I have tailored what, what I wrote in that book to appeal to both sexes. Um, basically, I'd like to talk about what I see as one of the fundamental tenets of happiness, and then I'm gonna trickle it into uh, a little bit of a, a, a sideline, which I think works for a lot of people. Have you ever heard the phrase, who's robbing this bank? It's something that my father used to say a lot, and he'd be doing something and someone would say, no, you do it this way or you do it that way, and he'd say, who's robbing this bank? Meaning, I'm the one in charge, let me do it my way. I think it's a question that a lot of people need to ask themselves because who is in charge of your life is something that I don't think a lot of people could answer if, if you put it to them directly. I know we've heard a lot, you've heard a lot of different scientific talks, so I'm gonna throw just a little bit more at you. In psychology, there's something called locuses of control. Um, and many psychologists and psychiatrists agree that one of the cornerstones of mental health is whether a person has an external or internal locus of control. Basically, a locus of control is how you view the world. People who have an external locus of control tend to assign responsibility to what happens in their lives to luck or fate. They'll sort of person who will say, what will be will be, it's in the lap of the gods, et cetera, et cetera. Someone who has an internal locus of control pretty much believes that they have responsibility for everything that happens in their life and that through hard work, discipline and focus, they can achieve their goals. It'll probably come as no surprise to you that people with an external locus of control on the, on the whole tend to suffer more from depression which I think is probably a result of them feeling they're not in control of steering their ship. I put it to you that by moving your locus of control inside of you, admitting that you are the, the captain of your ship is one of the fundamental tenets of happiness. Um, I'm sure someone's thrown this quote at you this, this in the last couple of days. Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, said, a man's character is his fate, a woman's character as well. Um, 
I believe that character is the choices that you make every day. And every day, all of us do make choices about the sort of people that we are. You get up in the morning, you have Vegemite or peanut butter or muesli. You drive to work in your big fuel-sucking four-wheel drive or you get on your bicycle or you catch the bus. You have coffee at work. You, you know, you click on the internet and, you know, spend two hours on Facebook or you actually do your work. You like black guys, Asian women, you like these, these you, you support South Sydney. When somebody says, what, you know, what is Anne like? They say, well, she's great. She's a big coffee drinker, loves coffee, mad about the, mad about the roosters, um, really into black guys, and um, really kind to her family. These are the things that people notice about you. And we don't often assign them as choices. You don't say, well, this is actually who I am. I think that a lot of people fall into things. Um, a lot of us spend more time deciding if we'll become a vegetarian or dress like Paris Hilton than we do on issues like fidelity, honesty, or our choice of ca career. We fall into things, stuff just happens, and before you know it, you're 50 years old, in a, doing a job you kind of like, waking up to a person you met at a barbecue 25 years ago, <laughs> drinking white wine at night because beer makes you too fat, wondering if your life is over. I've certainly been there. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if this is not a subconscious desire on our part to avoid responsibility in our lives. We all have a choice in who we become. Um, Joan Didion wrote a great, great essay called On Self-Respect. Um, I encourage you greatly to, to Google it and find it because it's a wonderful piece of writing. And she says that character is the willingness to accept responsibility for one's own life and is the source from which all self-respect springs. And I believe from self-respect is where we find true happiness. You might say, well, what is my character? Who am I truly? It's very easy, you are what you do. If you're the sort of person who goes into the staff toilets and fills a big yellow envelope up with toilet paper because you don't want to buy it, buy it for yourself and you take it home, which, which I've done. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Um, that's when I work for Murdoch. Um, <laughs> actually, f um, as an aside, I once did that and the guy who I was working with said, why are you doing that? I said, mate, I get paid $112 a week. And we're going down the escalators at uh, Central Station and I have my big envelope filled with dunny paper there and he went, rip. <laughs> <laughs> 20 packets of toilet paper spilled down the escalator and started getting caught down the bottom and I'm there trying to pick them up. and. So there was a, a, a really graphic demonstration of my character. If you, if, if you um, are going to take what I say as any sort of gospel, um, but it's but it's very true. You know, you might say to people, "I'm a non-smoker," but if you're sneaking cigarettes on the balcony at night, all the good intentions in the world don't add up to anything when the doctor says to you, "Congratulations, you've got lung cancer." You might say that you're faithful to your partner, but if you choose in a moment of weakness to want to toddle off and have sex in a cubicle with a stranger and it's discovered and your family is torn apart, you're a cheater. Your character is what you do. And I, I think that people sometimes think that character is, as uh, Didion says, something we associate with homely children and US, senator, US senators that have lost in the, the first round of the primaries. Character is... I think something that our grandparents probably knew very well. It's being able to put up with the prevarications of life and, and face them with, with courage. Now, I believe that one of the tenets of being a happy person, aside from having integrity and self-respect and character, and this is where I'm gonna go off on a little sidetrack, side um, is social dexterity. I believe that all of us would like to be a little bit more popular or, and to be able to, to mix in a group 
uh, successfully and to have people walk away from us saying, wow, aren't they a great person? I reckon it's a pretty easy thing to do, actually. Um, sorry, I've, I've lost my place. I'm on an iPad. I'm very, uh, very 2012, but it's just screwing with my head, I've got to tell you. Um, people who have a small life think that it actually happens by accident, but I'd challenge a person who wants a bigger life to monitor how many times they actually say yes to offers. There's a, a rule in theatre sports, I don't know whether you've ever, ever saw the theatre sports they did on the, um, what was it called uh, on, on the ABC? Well, thank God you're here, is it? Theatre sports is basically crazy games on a stage, but there's a rule in theatre sports that you never reject an offer. You always say yes to what the other person's um, suggested. So if, you know, they, they want to write a joke, sing a song about um, falling in love with a, a goat in China, and they sing the first, the first verse, and then you change the animal to a dolphin, that's called rejecting the offer. It breaks the momentum. It... Um, it basically, the, the whole skit will break down. I think that that's what a lot of people do in life. They're asked to do something and they break it down by saying no. They won't go with the flow. And <coughs> this is not to say that you should say yes to every offer of, you know, a funny cigarette in the car park or somebody says, hey, let's go get facial tattoos and, um, or... <laughs> You know, um, let's get in the car with those five drunk guys. Uh, you've got to use your, use your head, but I think by saying yes to offers, by saying yes to, um, to life, you open yourself up to options and to um, experiences that uh, make you fundamentally more interesting as a person. I'll give you an example. I'm sure, you know, uh, we've all had the uh, New Year's Eve dilemma. What am I going to do on New Year's Eve? It just, I hate it. I hate it. It's like, oh, what are you doing on New Year's Eve? Oh, I'm going to sleep for two days, hopefully. Somebody said to me, why don't you come to Poland? I said, Poland? Why the hell would I want to go to Poland for New Year's Eve? And I'd just written a, a column about saying yes to offers, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go to Poland for New Year's Eve. <laughs> So I went there, I was in Krakow, Poland, and the girl who's a friend of mine, she's a, a music video director, she said, she said oh, this, guy, um, this guy's a, 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 a famous Polish film director, and he walked into this nightclub, he's got eight women on his arm, honestly, he looked like a Bond villain, and he shepherds them all over to the table, and they all sit at this big round table with one bottle of champagne, and he served them all out this little portion of champagne, and my friend, she went and sat down with them. So here I am, standing at the bar by myself on New Year's Eve in Krakow, and there's this clown over there with nine girls. <laughs> so I said, all right, and I got myself a beer, and I went and I sat down next to him. I said, g'day, mate, my name's Sam, I'm from Australia. And he just sort of looked up and went like this to security, and these two goons came over and dragged me off back to the bar. <laughs> and I felt like a loser. And it was a pretty crappy New Year's Eve, but I've got a story to tell. That's the thing about saying yes. I think that... <laughs> saying yes to stuff makes you an interesting person because you've got stories to tell. <laughs> and I'm going to make lemons, lemonade out of lemons, all right? I might look like a loser, but anyhow. This is all well and good saying yes, say yes to life and say yes to offers, but what if you've got no confidence? I think a lot of people suffer from a lack of confidence and I think that it does make people genuinely unhappy because it shrinks their social circle, it shrinks their options and availability in life. I have one piece of advice for anybody who lacks confidence and that is do the things you fear. Um, again, I apologise for my language but I was shitting myself before I came up here and 
I think that I'll step down a little bigger person in some small way. But that's not to say that talking, talking in front of 500 people is what you need to do to, to live a better life. I think if, you're f if you feel that you lack confidence, do little things that you fear, whether that be going for a swim in the surf or doing a public speaking course or um, a cooking course or dancing. I'm a terrible dancer. I know that it would take a lot of courage for me to go to a dancing class because um, I'd probably get sued for treading on people's feet. But I think that if you want to build your confidence to live a bigger life, do the things you fear. You'll learn to deal with foreign or unpredictable situations and you'll know how to handle obstacles that you'll face in the future. What this is all leading me to is what was the original title of this uh, talk, which was how to be the most interesting person in the room. In order to do that, I do think you need to have a little bit of confidence, but people who are not socially dexterous, who find themselves challenged by social situations, can do one very simple thing, ask questions. I think that if you're in a social situation where you're being challenged, where you find yourself uncomfortable, by asking people questions about themselves, you will inevitably lead the conversation in a way that is pleasurable for them because who doesn't love talking about themselves? I have been in, const in, in, in many, many conversations where I've done this, usually out of boredom, and someone's come back to me a week later and said, oh, so-and-so thinks you're such a wonderful person. I said, yeah, because we spent 20 minutes talking about their dog. <laughs> but I'm trying not to be cynical, but being interested in other people, being able to lead a conversation and listen to what the other person says. I believe a speaker earlier to, today was talking about mindfulness. Most of us listen with intent. We wait to jump in on what the other person is saying. It's incredible what happens when you actually sit and listen to a person. And I think that's why people love going to psychiatrists and psychologists, because someone's just sitting there listening. It's like, wow, they're actually listening to me. It's a, it's a fabulous feeling being truly listened to. And I think if you actually sit down with somebody in a conversation and listen to what they say, ask questions about them, you will become the most interesting person in the room, because people love talking about themselves, and it's an... And, and it's, uh, an, an opportunity few of us are afforded in everyday life. Think about how often somebody truly listens to you and is truly interested in your life. So basically, um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I've got lots and lots of examples about things that you can ask people, but they're more, more related to men than, than women. I think I think a lot of people I think a lot of people get caught up in what am I going to talk about to, to 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 strangers when really you just have to listen and probably have a few canned subjects on hand you know so what do you think of Julie Gillard or what do you think of um, you know I've 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 got quite a few subjects that I love to bring out um, that get people talking deja vu is a great one because it's one of those subjects that people in every culture have experienced. Doesn't matter where you go, Germany, Africa, you say, have you ever had that feeling of deja vu? And people immediately get, get talking about it because it's something that crosses over cultures. Anyhow, I'm getting off the track here. Um, um, I've got lots more I could talk about, but I basically, um, I guess a, a, another point of social dexterity to keep in mind is storytelling. And being able to tell a good story, I think, is very important to being, a, to, to being able to hold the attention of a crowd and being able to hold the attention of a dinner table. Um, I think it's something that anybody who feels that they're socially challenged should, should practice, because we're all great storytellers. We've all seen more stories in our lifetime than our grandparents had seen in, in theirs. We're confronted, confronted with stories every day of our life. And being able to tell a good story is another way of of being socially dexterous, of being um, able to feel at home in a crowd. And as I said earlier, this is just one small part of happiness. To sum up, 
Social dexterity is part of an arsenal of stuff I believe that people use to be interesting and, to be, and also to be attractive. But in order to do this, you have to make choices. And in order to do that, you have to be aware of what those choices are. You need to be in control of your life and you need to exercise good character. To me, this is the bedrock of self-respect, which I believe is the foundation for happiness. Thank you.